lost my voice yesterday and it's just returning, so if it sounds a bit weird, that's why. Well, it's always a, a pleasure to come to uh, uh, SPA events. Uh, I, I must say, looking around the room though, I do worry a little bit about the future mm -hmm. of SPA, seeing a room full of uh, baby boomers. There might be a few generation wise here, but I think we're going to have to start bringing our children along in order to uh, carry the flag, unless of course we all have the uh, extraordinary uh, staying power of um, Frank Fenner. Let's hope we do. <clears throat> So let me begin by asking uh, you, uh, uh, having a little quiz. Which Australian politician said this? If Australia continues to grow at 4% per annum for the next 20 years, my kids are going to be nominally twice as wealthy as they are now. But I know they're not going to be twice as happy. One of the questions that is not put in the political process by either side of politics let alone answered, is towards what are we striving to grow? Now this observation, which some of you will recognise, is very resonant of the famous speech by Robert F. Kennedy in which he said, uh, GNP measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. The observation I quoted was in fact made by none other than Brendan Nelson, <laughs> who of course was a backbencher when he said it. Which uh, party? Well, he's never voted Labor in his life, so he must have been in the Liberal Party. Well, Dr Nelson was posing uh, the most fundamental challenge to the whole basis of politics uh, in Australia and other affluent countries. Yet, of course, we'd be very shocked, um, although in a pleasant way, if he actually made a similar comment now. Once they achieve positions of influence, those who doubt the benefits of continued growth, uh, including population growth, becomes, become strangely mute. Who, for example, remembers the very strong views uh, that uh, Nick Minchin used to express on the need to stabilise our population. To give him credit though, as late as 1999, as Minister for Science and Technology, uh, when launching a book by Doug Cox on Australia's uh, future, uh, which pointed out the ecological dangers of rapid population growth, Minchin said, we need to consider today the consequences of continuing our relatively rapid population growth. Do we want the mega cities, which could be the consequence of a large-scale immigration program. What will our grandchildren inherit of our natural environment, he asked. Minchin, of course, was in a very small minority in, uh, in, in Cabinet. For many years, Peter Costello delivered uh, budget speeches in, he, in which he insisted that we must increase our productivity to get the economy to grow faster. And he introduced uh, one measure after another designed to get people to work harder. High income earners were given tax cuts because, of course, high tax rates were thought to discourage them from working uh, longer hours. And people outside the labour market were offered carrots or beaten with sticks to get them to do their patriotic duty to get to work. <clears throat> the fact that Australians then, as now, work amongst the longest hours uh, in the industrialised world, that working hours had increased substantially since the early 1980s, and the economy was close to being fully employed, did nothing to puncture the government's determination to get us to work more. But why would we want to work more? Until the 1980s, falling working hours were universally accepted as a sign of national progress. We celebrated the 45-hour week, then the 40-hour week, and then we celebrated the 37-and-a-half-hour week. Then, we were happy to take part of the growth in productivity, uh, part of it in higher incomes, and part of it in more leisure. But under the harsh ideology of the 1980s, something changed. And the old ideas about what constituted progress were wiped away. Someone put a minus sign in front of progress. In the new uh, Calvinism of economic rationalism, 
taking more leisure became some sort of indulgence. We had a duty first and foremost to the economy. Well, I'm never, I never cease to be amazed at how our leaders and thinkers can push from their consciousness the obvious facts about economic growth and about population growth. It's as if there's a whole part of the brain that's shut down because activating it makes them feel uncomfortable and forces them to make hard decisions. And we saw a display of this. I'm not sure whether this came up at the, at the conference today, but we saw a display of it a fortnight ago in response to the latest news about the housing shortage in, uh, in this country, which of course is causing serious uh, difficulty for particularly for lower income households. Yet our leaders are unwilling to consider, let alone mention in public, what of course is one of the most important pressures giving rise uh, to this shortage, the rapid growth of population in Australia, fueled mainly by the record high levels of immigration. <clears throat> According to Bob Birrell, immigration accounts for about 40 to 50% of the growth in the number of households in Australia. And a household is a group of people who go looking for a house. Net immigration to Australia has grown to the extraordinary, unprecedented levels, 177,000 per annum when we include temporary entrance, which is easily the highest we've ever had. Uh, net uh, migration of uh, over 100,000 people has occurred for 12 uh, of the last uh, 20 years. And um, the, uh, the Labor government appears now ready to increase these levels above the extraordinary high uh, levels in the Howard years. So, but instead of thinking about the causes of the high levels of uh, demand for housing, all of the focus is on the inadequate supply of housing. And this has given rise to the crazy argument, dreamed up, of course, by the Housing Industry Association, that we need to import an extra 15,000 people in order to solve our housing shortage. Um, they would build new houses, these uh, people. But of course, the first question a number of people asked was, well, where are they going to live? Mr. Rudd pointed out that we have a shortfall of 30,000 houses in Australia, which presumably would rise to 40 or 45,000 once these uh, extra people were brought in to solve our problem. In the same week when everyone was wringing their hands about the housing shortage, the Victorian Premier was talking up projections about the rapid growth of Melbourne's population, which would, in a decade or two, perhaps, see Melbourne uh, grow bigger uh, than their great rival, Sydney. What a wonderful source of state pride to have more people squeezed into Melbourne than in Sydney. And, and cynics uh, uh, posed the question, why stop at Sydney? Why not Bangkok or Mexico City? <laughs> Once again, the population blind spot uh, rears its head. The refusal to consider the implications of quantity or quality. Another um, um, unspoken implication of uh, this rapid population growth, Ross Gittins has pointed out that rather than high levels of immigration easing inflationary pressures by um, opening up skills bottlenecks, which is the official argument, all the evidence indicates uh, that high levels of immigration add more to the demand side of the economy because immigrants come in and they spend more, they get jobs and produce, but they actually spend more. 